disclosure news and commentary number 53 53 53 53 53 hey um didn't get this out last night because i actually had work um so it was a thing i had to do <laughs> when the work comes up and presents itself i need to go do it that's the way it goes um what's the commentary about your hill to die on um that's what it's about thanks to brett brian dan and derek diana jeffrey joe black josh larry not that one the other one um i'm gonna talk about the other one um or that one larry goodman i'm gonna talk about him in a bit um logan fraser proc the croc rob rod southern honor double drop kick and of course the four uh the world walker eric viral pro uh the tag team transcendent and the og myron by the way before i forget to mention it um on advice from the guys themselves i asked i haven't listened to uh, tapped out in a while so i asked them what's a good one to listen to and they said the last one we did and you know what it was fucking great um and it made me on my run um listen to older ones and man they're still putting out great stuff even though there isn't a lot of wrestling to talk about they're finding different angles in which to talk about it and so i am going to do today um and then uh i talked to gunner miller or chatted with him online and like what's a good one to listen to and he said listen to my last one I listened to that one and I loved it. And in fact, tonight on the tipping point, it's going to be Gunnar Miller and I hosting because Larry, um, he's still going to produce the show, but he's like, you know, uh, it's kind of like heavy topic stuff Larry just didn't want to talk about tonight. So he suggested Gunnar. And so awesome. See if you can get him. And so we shall. And if it looks like um, I'm going to be going to tennessee at some point relatively soon i'm going to do my best to see if gunner wants me on his show which will probably be a very different feel tonight um what we're going to talk about on the tipping point is gunner and i are going to talk about uh wrestling has changed and we're going to speculate and kind of put our minds out there and think um what other changes are in store for wrestling? It's certainly a very tumultuous time. I hope you and yours are doing okay right now. Um, the girls are going to be back by this weekend, which is awesome. I have a ridiculously elaborate thing to film with them on Saturday. So wish me luck. Um, as you can see, I've been venturing out and trying different things. The uh, Boneyard video, which I had a lot of fun doing. Boy, did it take a lot of time. Um, the WWE, rightfully so, for copyright reasons, blocked it on YouTube. Um, no, I ain't even mad about it. I get it. Um, but maybe you could look on my Facebook and it's still there. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, big project I have coming up tomorrow. And it's probably going to take all day. Um, but I wanted to do an academic analysis of the Firefly Funhouse match. Not just what the um, allusions are to, the references made, but how it works as storytelling, how it invokes elements of um, everything from Greek tragedies to... Uh, the structure of a hero's narrative to actually imagery that it invokes um, from classic poetry um, to historical references, not just wrestling ones and all the rest of it. And what I think um, it's trying to accomplish and how it is trying to get there and the level of success that it attained in doing it. Um, it's going to be totally fucking nerdy and way too much. I'm just warning you right now. Um, I'm going to do my best to dive into it, get into it, kind of dust off. I've been getting my old teaching texts for those that don't know. I've taught, um, 
language arts, composition, literature, all that stuff at every level of the game. I'm talking literally from like preschool all the way through college. I've taught classes and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to bring as much of that academic stuff to it as I can. I just think it'll be a lot of fun. And clearly when they put out the Firefly Funhouse match, their intent was for it to be an art installation as a match. Um, it, it was technically a match in the most bare bones sense of the word. I think it's in, it was intended to be something way out there and way different than it had ever been done in pro wrestling. I think it accomplished that. Um, and I think it warrants more of a deeper analysis. How deep do I think fire? Fly Funhouse is somewhere on the art scale and worthy of analysis between the original Total Recall movie, which which while it does warrant some diving into and discussion, it's really not that hard to determine the big question of Total Recall, which is, does the whole thing take place in his Quaid's mind um, or is this a thing that actually happened, right? You can do arguments either way in Total Recall, but there is a right or wrong answer, right? Then you can take an art piece um, such as, um, let's say, Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Delights. Have fun looking that bitch up where it gives you so much and so many different elements and it ties itself into things that are easily understood by most people that, but yet those three frames of that artwork really kind of defy easy interpretation or perhaps not Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Delights as much as say Paradise Lost by John Milton, where different interpretations of Paradise Lost have led to very different ways that people frame even their understanding of the Bible and evil and Satan and God because of their different takes on Milton's Paradise Lost. Where is Firefly Funhouse on that level of complexity? Total Recall being kind of one of the easier things to sort of interpret and argue about because you can find a discernibly right and wrong answer. By the way, what's the right answer to Total Recall? It all happens in his fucking head. You want to argue with me about it? I would be happy to. Feel free to message me and we will argue back and forth. Right? Uh, Paradise Lost or Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Delights. Um, if you want to argue, like, what is the nature of evil? And is, is the different interpretations of evil, um, are they actually just a shade of good? Is there a good and evil? Is there a right and wrong? Um, we can go back and forth. Firefly Funhouse is much closer, I would argue, to Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Delights and, and Paradise Lost and the great works of art than it is to Total Recall, which is shocking. Am I saying that I loved it? I'm going to reserve those kind of judgments of my personal feelings of, did I enjoy it? Did I think it was a great match? Did I think it's, it bodes good things for wrestling? I'm keeping that out of it until the very end of the interpretation. Instead, I'm just going to do it as an academic exercise. Does that sound boring to you? Well, fuck you. <laughs> All right, let's get into this. Um, Southern Honor had to cancel its April show fucking bummer um they had to delay um, their version of the sci bummer again a number of wrestling shows and different things are having this to delay uh i've been getting these notices about this like um 
turnbuckle fucking event where they're um, where they allow you to hear all these interviews that they did with indie people. It looks like a couple of years ago. They're kind of I feel like they're throwing, trying to throw one past you. You could join for free. So I did. So I'm going to participate in that summit. I'm going to look at some of the interviews to see the ones that interest me and that kind of thing. And I'll let you know if I find anything cool. Um there's also an option where you could pay like $37 and then you can have access to all that stuff all the time. Bitch, I ain't got money like that. <laughs> but I am going to check it out and uh, let you guys know what I find. Um, what else is going on in wrestling? I know of at least two wrestling schools in Florida that are fucking running in secret um, and pressuring the students to, to show up in uh, group gatherings um, in spite of the fucking stay at home stuff. It, it's a fucking bad look. And, and let me say again, I get it from every reasoning, right? I, I think this thing is overblown bullshit. And so fuck it. Where you're going to get together. I think that's dumb. And I think it's very selfish but I understand the instinct. I need the money. I think that's an overriding factor, which makes the whole thing much more unseemly, don't you, wouldn't you say? Another reason might just be, I, I, I don't want to get behind. I don't want to feel like as a wrestling trainee that I'm getting behind, whereas other people are putting in work. I totally understand that instinct, but I, I will say that I've put out multiple videos and there's a lot of great advice out there about things that you can do. I mean, everything from like Gunnar Miller and Joe Black's fucking workout shit, which I think is awesome. I'm actually going to fucking do um, a workout that Joe Black put out as far as using a chair and fucking dumbbells. I do have a set of dumbbells. Uh, they're not great, but fuck it. Uh, I'm going to keep it going. My fucking abs hurt from yesterday fucking getting really back into the workout thing and doing it full bore yesterday and then i fucking ran today holy shit it's hot here in fucking florida um shocker okay um before i get to the commentary i came up with this idea i was talking with larry and we're having this very deep conversation about pro wrestling and I was talking about all the different kind of posts that I see from wrestling people and how they're very different in nature and how they've shifted and how they've done this and how they've done that and people's interpretation of WrestleMania. Of course, WrestleMania is the big story in wrestling. Uh, I'm going to be talking about it off and on. Um, so I'm not going to do some kind of big thing here. Like I said, I'm going to do the Firefly Funhouse review. I already did the fucking dedication song to right and all that shit um but it, i what it made me think of and then when as soon as i said it out loud larry went oh my god and i love to share that stuff let me start off by making a big and bold statement here at minute 13 pro wrestling as we understood it even three months ago is dead. It is forever altered and forever changed. It's dead. And people's reaction to it as seen through the lens of their reactions to WrestleMania 36 and different elements of WrestleMania 36. WrestleMania 36 to me is a great way a great prism through which to see what stage of grief that wrestling people are in when it comes to the death of professional wrestling. Now, you may not consciously acknowledge that, but everybody from Jim Cornette to the lowliest shitbird, from me to the lowliest shit bird, <laughs> to guys that have been doing this for a living, to guys who have been doing it prominently for years and years and decades, uh, to the brand new spanking wrestling student, on some level, feel and know 
that wrestling is dead. Let that sink in. Am I saying, but it's death in the sense that Eastern philosophy would understand it as opposed to Western. What I mean by that is death means a transformation. Wrestling has died more than once. I would argue the first time somebody, they started doing pro wrestling inside of a ring, it died a death. The first time it really got revealed publicly by through Pfeffer or whoever that the shit was fake, it died again. When Vince McMahon had to openly declare for tax purposes that it was performance, it died again. When wrestling got involved on some level with reality television, it died again. And when the high spot oriented false finish style became in vogue in wrestling, I think it died again. But this death feels like something much more tangible, much more real. Because this death of pro wrestling is not about style choices or performance choices. This is about truly facing the mortality of pro wrestling does not need to exist. And even the entities which we had convinced ourselves were permanent and could not be destroyed, we now understand are as vulnerable as anything else. They are man-made creations and they don't need to exist. Watching wrestling take place in front of no audiences and pro wrestling is powerless to do otherwise makes you realize how fallible things are. Major businesses that had gone through the process of taking over the country are now in danger of being dead. AMC Theaters, which has spent billions acquiring everybody in the hopes of being the monopoly, is in danger of being dead. The World Wrestling Entertainment, which in spite of falling ratings, dwindling creativity and this sense that they were completely wrongheaded about how they were doing everything, but nonetheless were turning record profits thanks to a couple of TV deals that they snookered people into now seem infinitely vulnerable. Must there be a Superman is one of my favorite sort of phrases that I've ever heard in regards to comics. This idea that maybe things don't need to exist. And folks, this sounds very serious, and I'm not saying it's not, but it needs to be faced. Pro wrestling is dead. And if WrestleMania 36 didn't show you that, I don't know what does. Because if you had a hard and fast definition of what pro wrestling was, where it derives its power, where it de derives its strength, we've shown that none of that applies anymore. I don't care if it's five people or it's 50 people. What if it's zero? Because that's where we're at. We can no longer argue because when the territories died and the WWF took over and then their reach got bigger and bigger and then there was competition along the way on a national scale, WCW and whatnot, but they all fell by the wayside. We uh, had to create the narrative that as the WWE goes, so goes wrestling. But even that notion has changed over the last year or two, remember? 
It used to be, uh, as the WWE was doing better and the WWF was doing well, there was a vibrant scene in the indies. I was part of that. I was fortunate to be part of that. In the late 90s, you get to get paid a decent amount of money to wrestle for the indies. Unthinkable now, right? And sure, there's like, you know, there's guys out there that are semi-charlatans who would convince you that, no, you can make a very viable living on the indies and blah, 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 blah. And they, they, these snake oil wrestling salesmen have pitched this bullshit for years and taken your money wrestling people while they pitched it. And it is bullshit. This notion that, oh, you can make like, well, uh, like two to three hundred dollars every stop along the way if you sell your merch and you horse shit. They're living on a wrestling myth. They're living on how wrestling was. Keep in mind, when I say the late 90s and the early 2000s where I did my shit, that was 20 years ago. That's a generation. Wrestling's different now. And now with CV and the rest of the shit going on, we see. Because the theory was at first, that what are the seven stages of death of wrestling grief. First one was shock and denial. And maybe some of you are still there. We're still going to run shows. We're still going to find a way. All this coronavirus shit is bullshit. It's all bullshit. Oh, it's all overhyped nonsense. The, the elaborate conspiracies that some wrestling people are creating about this whole thing is denial to the utmost. That's a very natural stage of grief. And there are wrestling people who are still caught in it or partially here still. And why not? It is shocking. All these bookings that she had. Gone. WrestleMania just happened. Too big for just one night, right? And all of those shows, at least 23 by my count, that were going to take place in Tampa during that week, gone. The attempts of people to keep shows going, gone. Right? Pain and guilt. We're still going to make sure the boys get paid. I'll help you guys. Like, you know, here, put your link here and then people will buy T-shirts and da, 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 da. There's a lot of guilt going around as well. And a lot of pain. People sharing the bookings that they've lost. People through some sense of guilt, whether it's people who run shows or people who kind of live on the fringes of pro wrestling, like the Tap Tap guys or myself or whatever, who are attempting in some way, shape or form, or Will, Will Huckabee through his podcast, right? Him and Mika, like, we'll, we'll share your shit and that, that'll get you some money and da, 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 da. But we all know it's bullshit, don't we? To an extent. And, it, and if you've made a little money through that, awesome, right? And the pain is very visceral, which is why when... Braun Strowman kind of takes a shot at like, oh, these, this shit where people are trying to help indie wrestlers. Fucking, you just got to fucking find a way. That's why the reaction to him was so angry. These are people who are in pain and these are people who are feeling guilty uh, about what's going on in pro wrestling. And Braun Strowman being very callous about it didn't help his cause, right? Anger and bargaining. There's a lot of posts going up about wrestling's past and, and angles that people have been involved in and situations, and all of them are tinged with a bit of anger. Look at this good shit that I did that's better than this other shit. There's a lot of anger. Um, now I'm not going to get to do this, and I was supposed to wrestle this person. And there's bargaining going on. Why do you think fucking Tiger King is so big amongst wrestling people? They're having to find a place to put their attention and their devotion 
and they're creating community any way they can even that's even if that's with a, yet another Carol Baskin fucking meme the Tiger King thing fits right into wrestling and people are fucking nuts about it but it's not because it's that great let's be honest it's because it's your surrogate pro wrestling right now stage four Depression, reflection, and loneliness. People do feel isolated. People are lamenting the loss. People are thinking about pro wrestling. Maybe it's never going to come back. Maybe it's not going to be the same. It's the realization that wrestling is dead as we knew it. That's the people who hated either the Boneyard, Firefly Funhouse, or both, what I read and what they're saying is they sense that, fuck, pro wrestling as I understood it is dead. And Triple H immediately going like, yeah, we're going to do more of this shit in the future. And, you know, with Hardy arriving in AEW, you think fucking final deletions aren't going to be happening left and right. The way people are reacting to Firefly Funhouse, Boneyard, the notion that we're going to have to do more and more art installation pieces as opposed to professional wrestling. Does that bother you, that phrase? It's the fucking truth. It doesn't mean that it can't have elements of pro wrestling, but pro wrestling, as you understood it and fell in love with it, is dead. Because we have to adapt to this grim new reality. The grim new reality is you may not wrestle a match in a ring in front of a discernible crowd for months. Until the fall. And even then. I mean, look at the look at the fucking bargaining that's going on in different memes that you read. When all of this is done and we're back to normal and everybody's going out, all the restaurants are going to be full and all the sporting events are going to be full and blah, 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 blah. We just have to get through this. That's bargain. Who are you bargaining? You're bargaining with God. You're bargaining with the fucking grim reality that you have no power to control. It's normal. When the life that you've known in general but pro wrestling in particular is dead. But that death signifies a change. It just means it's going to be in a different form, but not a similar form. That's what I got to make clear to you. Pro wrestling has changed. I've said for years, the miracle about pro wrestling isn't that it should be doing better because blank. I, I, I've been saying for years, ask anybody. The miracle is that pro wrestling still fucking exists at all. Because pro wrestling is getting into a very dangerous new stage. Because things like Boneyard and Firefly Funhouse, because the WWE only has one commodity that no one else can have right now. And that is pathos and this idea that they have a history that they have set up created constructed and monetized that can be referenced boneyard doesn't work if undertaker is not in it without his legacy and the meaning people attach to him boneyard is fucking dumb as fuck hate to break it to you it's a badly constructed action scene and you can watch most movies and they'll do it better. Pro wrestling is now going to have to fight mediums that do it better already. And they're going to have to get great fast. And the only thing that they have on their side is this idea of their own history and their own in-group mentality. The fact that the WWE universe gives a fuck about who John Cena is and theoretically could give more of a shit about who the fiend is. 
It's the only reason that works. Without John Cena, that thing doesn't work at all. Oh, you do that thing with fucking Austin Theory feuding with the Fiend and they try to put together some kind of fucking clip package thing. It doesn't work at all, does it? No. So they have to basically use their history and their own created telling of stories. Here's the problem with that. Are there stars for whom that matters? Here's a problem with that. When you invoke these kind of things, that's a lot of hype that you have to deliver on. Let's be honest. Edge and Randy Orton was shit. They built it right. They ran into a fucking stumbling block with the whole CV thing. And then they went out to try to do the greatest thing ever. And it failed spectacularly. And how many times... Can people watch a thing? Because now ships have to get pushed completely on the table which with each thing they're doing in wrestling. They can't afford for things to be mediocre because there are too many options. How have the ratings been for pro wrestling? Dog shit. The, the mentality was everybody's stuck at home. They're going to be watching shit. Yeah. How many options do you have to watch shit? A lot. And the truth is, through the first four stages, most wrestling people are more excited about Tiger fucking King than about pro wrestling, whether they want to admit that or not. Because their affection needs to go somewhere, and pro wrestling, they understand it, is dead. On some level, they understand it. It's the next stage. The upward turn. People are being excessively positive about wrestling. Um, it has been interesting to me to look at how people have been talking about WrestleMania. Because I think there are three different positive responses to say Boneyard. The people who genuinely enjoyed it because they were able to turn off their minds to the fact that there were inconsistencies and things that are distinctly not pro wrestling about it. There are people that are clinging to an excessive love of it because they're afraid to let wrestling go. And then there's the people who just enjoyed it because they're able to enjoy pro wrestling no matter what form it takes. And no matter what deaths have occurred. So for them, the move to liking Boneyard was no move at all. They're the people who already thoroughly enjoy Invisible Hand Grenades and, and Orange Cassidy and all the rest of it. And again, this is not me passing judgment. This is just me making an observation. The people who went out of their way to talk about how much they love Firefly Funhouse... Most of them, you can read very easily between the lines and see it is one of three things. I don't want to look stupid by pretending I didn't understand all of it. If this is what pro wrestling is going to be, then I'm just going to embrace it because pro wrestling forever, even though on some level I understand that it's dead. Or the people that are nostalgia junkies and love referential humor. If you're a family guy guy, you're this person. And again, not passing judgment. I'm just saying a lot of what passes in the modern age of great art and high comedy is merely people showing you what you are already familiar with and going like, remember this? And you go, yup. Ha ha! And then you too go, ha ha! Because a connection has been made, even if it's a low-level connection, passing itself off as a high-level connection. Pretty deep, pretty heady shit, right? Stage six out of seven. Almost there. Reconstruction and working through. That's, if I had to say, if I was at any stage, it might be this one. 
Sorting out what things mean. What does it mean to do pro wrestling in an era where you don't have a crowd? What does it mean to reconstruct how stories are told and who the audience is? It's why I was so high on what Anarchy did with the empty arena match. Because it's an attempt to reconstruct wrestling. And that's the league that's been around the longest in Georgia. And they're figuring it out. And I think in a different way, AWE also is attempting to reconstruct and work through all of this. I think the fact that they were the first to say, the CV shit, we're not fucking running shows. I thought it was a very mature decision. And I think it showed, some would argue it just showed like a lack of faith. On the contrary, I think they just went, we're not going to just fight through this fucking bullshit in the first two or three stages on a subconscious level. We're just going to accept a reality and then figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to do it from here. It's great. Finally, acceptance and hope. And some people are rushing to the stage or trying to put on the happy face and say they've already done it. We already accepted the fact that it, uh, I don't know if anybody's here yet. Because I don't think they really understand or have thought about at length. And Gunnar Miller and I will attempt to do that tonight to an extent. Um, what is the new reality? What are the possible models of the future of the new reality? Where does pro wrestling go from here? How can it remain relevant? Because folks, let's be blunt. Nobody's watching this shit. NXT's at a half million. AEW... It seems like every other week they go from, okay, they've kind of figured out how to do this shit to, oh, fuck, that was not good. They're still figuring it out. And WrestleMania has given us a respite and a bit of hope. But keep in mind, to put that show on and people excessively thanking the WWE for doing it, as if they didn't have their own selfish reasons to do it. There's a sort of a denial of that, isn't there? There's sort of a bargaining going on there on some level. But it's not to say that it wasn't amazing. And all those guys taking those, as I kept calling them, cold bumps. Holy fucking shit. Um, I've had to do filming stuff where it was more or less stunt work and but without audiences around. Shit's not easy. Of course, I admire that part of it. But at the same time, they lost a shit ton of money and don't think that they're not going to try to make that collateral back in a different way, right? Through continually reminding us about their noble acts. But any hope that WrestleMania meant now we get momentum and we keep going should have been removed when you saw Raw last night because most of that show blew fucking donkey dick. This is all new. Of course it's all new. A death has happened. And that death is pro wrestling. Shock and denial, pain and guilt, anger and bargaining, depression, reflection and loneliness, the upward turn, reconstructing and working through, and then finally acceptance and hope. That's a very important word, hope. But hope doesn't happen just because you close your eyes and say it out loud again and again and again and again. You have to intellectually come to grips with what am I able to control? What am I able to contribute? And then how can I accept the things that I can't change? And there's a whole lot of things you can't. And that's the hardest thing for people to deal with, especially Americans, especially wrestling people. Just giving you some insight. Commentary. <sighs> Shut the fuck up. There's a lot of hills that people are dying on right now, and they're hurting themselves in the future just because they can't shut the fuck up. Um, silence is always an option. Introspection is always an option. People are picking very strange hills to die on, and I get it. 
if you're focused on an enemy, it's how people are sort of geared. I'm going to focus on this enemy. Um, and you can see numerous examples of people feeling the need to put out conspiracy theories or create enemies or find enemies amongst the people that they do business with or know or care about and weeding them out publicly. Let me just say this. If you're going to pick your hill to die on, be fucking smart. We're cooped up. Our lives have changed. Pro wrestling is dead. And we're not sure what form it's going to take yet. If any. Everything that we'd worked so hard for, for the most part, is obliterated and gone. And we've been forced, in the world of the dead, we're forced to finally start living. And for a lot of people, that's really hard. For someone like me, full disclosure, I am a guy who's used to working my fucking ass off. And now I'm having to work my ass off to find ways to work my ass off. And money stuff scary as shit. And I worry that I'm in a state that's run by people who are incredibly incompetent and that a lot of the wrestling people that I know are twice as dumb. Being honest. But the, but the face that I put on the front, and we all have a choice on what face to put. It's about my kids. It's about the videos that I do, etc. I am taking time to learn new skills. Moonyard! I am taking time to come up with new projects. I am taking time to hustle up as much work as I can and invoke all the resources that I can. And when, when people have hired me to do little things here and there, I do them to the utmost best of my ability. And hopefully that's setting the stage for what's going to happen later on. I'm picking my hills to die on. And the hill that I'm choosing is survival and thriving. Not engaging in esoteric political arguments. That is stupid. That is nothing but a temporary respite for you to feel good about yourself. It's signaling. And I see it from every side of the political spectrum. It's not the hill to die on. Just my advice. You're better off figuring out how to make you, your world better, and then expand that circle as much as you can. Think about the seven stages of grief. And they are stages for a reason. You do need to go through them. And you shouldn't punish yourself if you haven't. If you're not learning a new skill or a language or something like that. Of course, that's stuff I've suggested in the past. Sure. But maybe it's just a matter of just having your shit together and fucking putting on clothes for a few hours a day um, and getting out in the sunshine a bit, whatever, um, whatever you got to do, as long as it's to your benefit, as long as it's a hill worth living on instead of just a stupid hill to die on. Because I'm seeing too many people who are ruining relationships, ruining their own wrestling businesses they purport to love and sacrifice for, just for the sake of a temporary feeling of feeling okay while doing long-term damage. That's a fool's errand. Idle hands are the devil's handiwork, right? Right? And I get that we all have a lot of idle hands right now. But those idle hands are also an opportunity. And even if it's 20 to 30 minutes of just thinking things through a little bit, breathing a little bit, and making the choices to be silent, asking yourself the question that I love asking the most of other people. What good is going to come of what you're doing? And if the answer is 
I guess nothing really. Or if you're having to overly justify to come up with an answer that feels right to you instead of reality, you're on the wrong hill to die on. Quit fucking dying on these stupid fucking hills and start living on the highest one. This has been Full Disclosure.